Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot for coming out today. My name is Jeff Lee, and I'm the director of the Rocky Mountain Land Library. And on behalf of the Land Library and the Tattered Cover Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you to today's Land Series program. Today, we're very happy to welcome historian Elizabeth Fenn, author of Encounters at the Heart of the World, a history of the Mandan people a fascinating history of the Upper Missouri River Tribe that first came to Western consciousness through the Lewis and Clark expedition and the work of artists such as George Catlin and Carl Bodmer. Elizabeth Fenn is a professor of history at the University of Colorado in Boulder and is the author of two previous books, including the award-winning pop Pox Americana, the Great Smallpox Epidemic of 1775 to 1782. Historian Alan Taylor had this to say about today's book. By recovering the history of a set of native villages at the very heart of our continent, Elizabeth Fenn brilliantly shows how we can rethink the past. Please welcome Elizabeth Fenn. Well, thank you all for, for coming today. I, I, I had my doubts as I was driving in when I saw how beautiful the weather was and how heavy the, uh, the traffic was as I came down from Longmont. Um, so thanks for coming and thank you also to the Tattered Cover and to the Land Library for inviting me and for hosting this event. Now, my book, as you can see, is concerned with encounters at the heart of the world. Uh, the heart of the world was the term that the Mandan people used to re refer to their homeland in modern North Dakota, uh, right where the Hart River flows into the Missouri River from the west. Now, for me, uh, the first encounter at the heart of the world actually came during research I did back in the late 1990s on a smallpox epidemic, a smallpox epidemic that swept the entire continent from 1775 to 1782, uh, afflicting the Mandans and afflicting thousands of other people. So what happened was that I found myself researching the Upper Missouri and, and accounts and reports of the Upper Missouri villages and of the smallpox epidemic in the upper Missouri villages intrigued me. I was deeply impressed by what you might call the metropolitan qualities of indigenous life in what I have come to call late medieval and early modern North Dakota. Uh, so how could it be, I, I found myself wondering, how could it be that there were enormous populations that we knew almost nothing about at the very center of the North American continent. Uh, there were 12,000, 15,000, or possibly even more Mandans, Mandans alone, clustered in densely populated earth lodge villages uh, on the upper Missouri at the time of the American Revolution. Uh, those numbers, 12, 15, or 1,000 or more, those numbers don't even count the neighboring Hidatsa people uh, who probably actually surpassed the Mandans in their numbers. So as I contemplated the Mandan story, I realized that it turns American history inside out. Um, the story from the center of the continent serves as a kind of a counter-narrative to the classic triumphalist uh, version of American history that begins on the coasts and marches inexorably inland. 
the Mandan story also crosses uh, what I consider to be an absurd division of time itself, uh, by which historians ignore anything that happened before European eyewitnesses uh, were, uh, were on the scene, uh, almost as though earlier events are not also a part of American history. So I want to start today by reading the opening of the first chapter of, of, of this book, uh, describing a, a Mandan village called Double Ditch. So Double Ditch, or, uh, or Yellow Earth Bank, or Ye uh, Yellow Earth Village, uh, Yellow, Earth, uh, Yellow Earth Village, or Double Ditch, was probably the premier Mandan town of the 18th century. So uh, what I'm going to read to you is, is a description of what it was like when I first encountered this town in August of 2002. Double Ditch Village is desolate, windy, and magnificent. Perched on a grassy plain overlooking the Missouri River from the east, it is the kind of historic site I like best. It has no reconstructions and little interpretation beyond a few state-funded signposts. This unleashes the imagination in ways that places like Colonial Williamsburg never will. If I believed in ghosts, they would abound here. Alas, I do not. But my mind's eye still populates the town with hazy human figures, domed earth lodges, raised drying scaffolds, and yapping dogs. I picture women in hide-covered bull boats on the river below, ferrying firewood from afar. How full of life this place was, how quiet it seems now. The Riptare Mandans, one group among several that made up the Mandan people, occupied Double Ditch for nearly 300 years. Shallow basins in the soil mark the places where they built structures for their daily life. Most of the smaller depressions we see today indicate the location of cash pits, once the warehouses for thousands of bushels of corn. The larger depressions denote earth lodges. The landscape is pockmarked with these silent homes of ancient Americans. I walk among them in the blustery wind. Double Ditch takes its name from two distinctive trenches that once served as fortifications for the Mandan settlement here. Visitors can still see these trenches today. There are mounds, too, not giant edifices like those famous ones built in what is now Illinois by the people of Cahokia, but small, low-lying forms on the outskirts of the town. Like the ditches, they had defensive purposes, perhaps sheltering Mandan warriors as they fended off attacks by the Sioux. For an hour or so, I am alone among the lumps and depressions in the uneven field. Then a motorcyclist pulls into the looped parking area and doffs his helmet. I wave to him, and we wander together over the town site, wondering, speculating, and imagining out loud. He is a local, rides a BMW, and likes to visit Double Ditch on his outings. I admire his bike when we return to the parking lot. He straddles the seat and extends his hand. Thanks for visiting North Dakota, he says. Then he starts the engine and leaves. I do the same thing a few minutes later, crunching across the gravel in my rented car and turning left on Highway 1804. Behind me, Double Ditch reverts to the wind and the gophers. I have no idea that just a few weeks earlier, archaeologists had made stunning discoveries about the empty town and its history. So what the archaeologists discovered was that this, this settlement site had been misnamed. Uh, and as you, can, as you can see from the photograph, uh, the town's name reflects its most striking feature, two clearly discernible fortification trenches uh, that still delineate former boundaries of uh, this once palisaded town. But using a, an array of, of sort of high-tech, non-intrusive, and by non-intrusive I mean uh, non-digging 
uh, techniques, archaeologists discovered what you can see in, in this image. There are, in fact, two additional trenches beyond the two visible ones. So, in other words, the town once had a, a bigger population, probably had a population of 2,000 people or more, had a bigger population than, than we had previously imagined. Um, so, if you're looking at this image, here's the ditch you can see today, the first one. Here's the second ditch you can see today. And then, what they unearthed is a third ditch and a fourth ditch. And you can see bastions in the, the, the outermost ditch. Um, so, yeah, it was just, it was, everybody w was just floored by, by, by this discovery. Now, these impressive settlements and these large populations point to the Mandan's remarkable success in what was really a hostile environment. North Dakota winters are very long and very cold. Rainfall averages less than 20 inches a year today. Uh, and the Mandans If I can get my first map up here, the Mandans, as you, as you can see, uh, they lived beyond the 100th meridian, uh, which, is, which is commonly accepted as, sort of, as the, the limit of the western limit of non-irrigated agriculture. So the people, the people who were most responsible uh, for, for Mandan horticultural success were Mandan women. Uh, and what I'd like to read next is, uh, is just a few excerpts of the, from the section of the book in which I begin to describe how Mandan women pulled this off in, the, in this hostile environment. And as I said, th these are really, these are, these are excerpts. Buffalo Bird Woman loved to watch her grandmother work in the garden. Thanks to Turtle, Turtle is her grandmother, thanks to Turtle's traditional ways and to Buffalo B Bird Woman's memories, we have some idea of how Mandan women of earlier centuries worked at their springtime chores. Turtle's traditional bone hoe, bone hoe would have been made from a bison scapula, typically a shoulder blade from a bison. Uh, the turtle's traditional bone hoe was like an old friend. It cared for her by bringing food from the earth, and she cared for it by stowing it safely beneath her bed in the earth lodge. If buffalo bird woman or other children tried to play with it, she cried, nah, nah, go away, let that hoe alone, you will break it. Once the corn hills were ready, dead roots and stalks removed, soil loosened and raked, the planting began. The women moved from one hill to the next, sowing six to nine seeds in each. If she started before sunrise, Buffalo Bird Woman could plant 225 hills by mid-morning when she headed home for breakfast. Planting corn thus by hand was slow work, she remembered but easier in the early hours, while the air was cool. There was no respite once the corn was in, since squash and beans came next, both planted in earthen hills of their own, interspersed with the maize, a practice that produced a useful symbiosis among species. Corn, the most important cultigen, depletes essential nitrogen from the soil, while beans have root nodules that do the opposite. With the help of surrounding fungi and bacteria, they create their own nitrogen. And when they decompose at the end of the season, they replenish soil impoverished by corn. Even better, lanky corn stalks serve as trellises for climbing beans. And the beans, in turn, keep maize from toppling when high winds blow. Squash plants, with their wide leaves and ground trailing vines, form a living mulch that shields the soil from the drying effect 
of the summer sun. Now children accompanied the women to the fields. Buffalo Bird Woman recalled her grandmother making a little booth out of willows thrust in the ground in a circle with leafy tops bent over and tied together. A fire burned inside where food simmered to fuel the day's labor. I loved to go with my mothers. The Mandan's children counted all their mother uh, counted their mother and all their mother's sisters as mothers. So you know, she said, "I loved I loved to go with my mothers to the cornfields." Buffalo Bird Woman remembered. As a small child, she offered little assistance. I liked better to watch the birds than to work. She said. She also learned to sing. Corn, in the words of one Mandan song, is my best friend and my pleasure. Singing passed the hours, but according to Buffalo Bird Woman, it had another function, too. The watchers in the fields sang to make the garden feel good and grow. The music began with spring planting and continued through the harvest, all the while expressing the villagers' devotion to the plants that sustained them. We Indian people loved our gardens, just as a mother loves her children, Buffalo Bird Woman said. And we thought that our growing corn liked to hear us sing, just as children like to hear their mother sing to them. By late June, with corn plants stretching skyward, the villagers turned their attention to bison. Not being very responsive today. Okay, now, now the Mandans were not just farmers and hunters. I said they, they turned their attention to bison for the, the summer hunt. But the Mandans were not just farmers and hunters. They were also merchants. Uh, and the Mandan and Hidatsa villagers, the Hidatsas again were their close neighbors just to the north. Uh, the Mandan and Hidatsa villages uh, were, were linchpins in a, in a sprawling Northern Plains trade network. And it was foodstuffs, uh, especially corn, that drove their commerce. And, and even after uh, French and British and U.S. traders and explorers reached the Mandan villages, corn, grown and exchanged by Mandan women, remained the centerpiece of their trade. And the experience of Lewis and Clark's Corps of Discovery, which wintered among the Mandans in 1804 and 1805, uh, helps to give us a sense of, of this commerce. So I'm going to read uh, an, again some excerpts from uh, Lewis and Clark's experience of the Mandan corn commerce. Uh, during that winter of 1804 and 1805, and it'll give you a sense of just how vast th this trade was. So among the Mandans and Hidatsas, the corn traffic, this is with Lewis and Clark, the corn traffic began on October 28th, the day after the Corps of Discovery arrived. We had several presents from the women of corn and boiled hominy, soft corn, etc., etc., Clark wrote, and thereafter it was constant. Will you be so good as to go to the village, responded an Indian messenger, or requested an Indian messenger on October 30th. The Grand Chief will speak and give some corn. He advised the newcomers to take bags along. The next day, at Black Cat's Riptare Mandan town on the east side of the river, Clark took delivery of about 12 bushels of corn which was brought and put before him by the women of the village. And thus it went for the duration of the winter. 11 bushels on November 2nd. Several rolls of parched meal on November 11th. Buffalo robes and corn on November 16th. More corn on December 21st. Still more on December 22nd. And great numbers of Indians bringing corn to trade on December 23rd. More corn taken in for payment on December 30th. 
On January 1st, 1805, 13 strings of corn came in. January 15th brought several women loaded with corn. And January 21st brought in considerable corn. The first day of February yielded some corn from a Hidatsa war chief. So all this corn changed hands either by barter or by gift exchange. In February, many natives visited the blacksmith John Shields and paid him considerable quantity of corn for his work. The men of the expedition thus procured not just corn sufficient for the party during the winter, but also about, this is Clark writing, about 70 or 90 bushels to carry with them when they left in the spring. 70 or 90 bushels. Well, I grew up in New Jersey, so I didn't know what a bushel was. <laughs> How big was a bushel? Well, in 1804, units of measure had yet to be standardized. Because of the vagaries in English law, which remained the basis for American measurements, uh, and, and also because of the, uh, the, the, the variously sized quarts and gallons that went into a bushel, at least eight different bushels existed. And regional variations and traditions added to the confusion. Uh, in some places, a, a, a heaping bush bushel was the norm. In other places, a level bushel prevailed. So we don't know what criteria Lewis and Clark used. But the modern standard gives us an idea of the amount of corn involved. One modern bushel equals eight gallons of capacity. And according to the Iowa Corn Growers Association, a bushel of dried shelled maize weighs 56 pounds. So 70 or 90 bushels was a lot of corn. It's probably two U.S. tons or more. But for villagers accustomed to supplying maize to thousands of visiting nomads each year, the grain consumed and carried away by the Corps of Discovery would have seemed less impressive than it does to us today. Now, the commerce that you see outlined on the map, there's going to be a quiz on this at, at the end. <laughs> Now, the, the commerce that, that you see outlined here was really a double-edged sword. Obviously, it brought bison products, handicrafts. Uh, eventually, it brought European and Euro-American manufacturers to the Mandan towns. But it also brought novel contagions uh, introduced to America by European and African newcomers. Uh, the first novel contagion may even have reached the Mandans in the late 1500s. Uh, this is really, really early when you think about it. Columbus, we all know, sailed in 1492. A hundred years later, the first imported diseases were probably arriving at the very center of the continent by the late 1500s. By the 1700s, wave after wave of smallpox, measles, uh, whooping cough, and other illnesses swirled across the plains. Now, microbes uh, were not the only newcomers. Horses. Horses spreading northward out of Spanish, the Spanish colonies reached the Mandans probably by the year 1740. Uh, and horses obviously facilitated that commerce that you saw on the previous map, but they also probably facilitated the spread of contagion. Now another new species, another new species reached the Mandans in 1825, uh, by which time the Mandans, depleted by, by epidemics, had moved 50 miles north to live bes right beside the Hidatsas at the Knife River's confluence with the Missouri. And most of the Mandans who moved up to the Knife River uh, settled at, uh, 
at Mitotahankush, the village that you see here in this, in this Catlin painting. Uh, at any rate, I said this another new species arrived in 1825, and that new species, that new species was the Norway rat. And I'd like to read you a little bit about the experience of the Mandans uh, with the Norway rat. English speakers call the creature by many names. Norway rat, brown rat, sewer rat, wharf rat. Its Latin name is Ratus Norvegicus. The Mandans first met it in 1825 when Henry Atkinson's massive military force landed at Mitatahankush. At least two, one female and one male, disembarked at the Knife River villages. And I now realize, having written that sentence and now it's in print, could have been one pregnant female, right? <laughs> Um, had an army keelboat not brought them, the steamboats that followed surely would have. Compared with smallpox, measles, cholera, and whooping cough, the brown rat was a newcomer to North America, having arrived late in the mid-1700s, probably aboard a ship from England. By 1812, it had reached Kentucky, and 13 years later, it got to the upper Missouri. For the Indians, the sight of a new creature was a momentous occasion, perhaps even a visitation of the spirits. When George Catlin came on the scene a few years later, this major event was still being discussed and elaborated. As he heard the story, hundreds came to watch and look at the strange animal. No one, he reported, dared to kill it. Now the deer mouse, a native species, had long plagued upper Missouri earth lodges whose inhabitants complained that the little rodents were very destructive, gnawing clothing and other manufactures to pieces in a lamentable fashion. So when the villagers saw a Norway rat devouring a deer mouse, they were initially delighted. If the newcomers multiplied, perhaps they would rid Indian homes of the bothersome deer mice. Perhaps the spirits had indeed intervened. The rats multiplied at a rate hard for human beings to comprehend. Some wild rats live as long as three years, but one year is average. Brief though it may be, that 12-month lifespan is sufficient for a female brown rat to accomplish impressive reproductive feats. She reaches sexual maturity at three to four months and then is virtually sure to conceive each time she is fertile. For during a single six hour fertile period, she might mate as many as 500 times. After she has mated successfully, pregnancy lasts about 23 days and she can breed again less than 24 hours after delivering. A normal litter yields six to eight pups, and a typical female has seven litters a year, or roughly 50 offspring. Now, as luck would have it, uh, these, these invaders were particularly successful at the Knife River villages, having stumbled into an unlikely bonanza. Now, I, what you're looking at is a picture of a, a, a cash pit. This is a Hidatsa cash pit. Mandans and Hidatsas uh, used I almost identical uh, agricultural techniques. In fact, much of what we know about Mandan agriculture we know from the Hidatsas. Um, so this is below ground. That's the key thing to be aware of. Uh, and to give you a sense of scale, these things were huge. We, Indian women used ladders to descend into their cash pits. So this would have been maybe six, six seven feet deep. Okay. So as luck would have it, these invaders were particularly successful at the Knife River villages, having stumbled into an unlikely bonanza. Centuries of experience had taught the Mandans that deer mice did little to damage subterranean grain caches. Deer mice often occupy the burrows of other animals, but they do not dig much themselves. The Norway rat, by contrast, burrows assiduously and even creates its own underground food depots. 
Thanks in part to this digging behavior, the rats of Mitatahankush soon exploded in number, devouring corn by the ton and threatening the villagers' very livelihood. The invaders rid the earth lodges of deer mice and established their own niche. Too late, the Indians realized that any damage the deer mice inflicted paled next to that caused by the newcomer. Seven years after the rat's arrival, George Catlin reported that Mandan caches where they buried their corn and other provisions were robbed and sacked. The maze in many of these repositories beneath the floors of native lodges actually supported the earth that people walked on. But now, Catlin said, the very pavements under their wigwams are so vaulted and sapped that they were actually falling to the ground. Now, uh, the, the town of Mitatahankush actually sat right next to a little American fur company post known as Fort Clark. And I, sh I should have phrased it the other way around. It was the fur, fur company traders who built the post beside the Indian village. Um, and they were literally side by side. Uh, in Fort Clark alone, by one report, the rodents consumed five bushels of corn, some 250 pounds each day. Of course, the Mandan towns contained much more grain than the post did, but no estimates exist of the, Mandan, uh, of, of the damage done in the villages. If Norway rats ate 250 pounds of grain a day at Fort Clark, they undoubtedly ate much more at Mitatahankush and Raptare, the second Mandan town. The Indians were disconsolate. The rats were, quote, a most disastrous nuisance and a public calamity, they told Catlin. Far from being a blessing, the creatures were a curse and there were additional setbacks to come. Now, I, I'm going to make you uh, read the book, actually, to find out what, what the setbacks to come were. Um, I, I, end, I end the story in, of, in the book in the year 1845, uh, but I, I want to just add on to that by, by pointing out that challenges for the Mandan people have persisted. Uh, since, since 1845 when I closed the book. Uh, the, the challenges have included uh, reservation life, adapting to the notorious allotment system. The challenges also included uh, in 1953 the inundation of Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara lands uh, by flooding um, after the construction of the Garrison Dam. And I'll also add that recently there has been a new turn. Uh, North Dakota's Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara people are now grappling with the Bakken Shale oil boom uh, and grappling with hydraulic fracturing, something that's uh, very familiar to us. Uh, it's even more familiar to the Mandans, Hidatsas, and Arikaras now. And, and what I've learned in my recent visits to the three affiliated tribes reservation is that hydraulic fracturing, you know, is a process, obviously it creates prosperity for some and, and problems for others. Uh, and, and my conclusion is really that it's, uh, it fractures not, but not just shale, but also communities, which is what's happening up there today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and I'm happy to take questions from anybody uh, who has them. Thank you. Yes. Now there, I believe there are about 3,000 people, some total, living on the reservation. Okay, that includes Mandans, Hidatsas, and Arikaras. Uh, what's happened, there was another smallpox epidemic in 1837, 1838 that really crushed the Mandans and their numbers dwindled to probably fewer than 300 in 1838. Now since then, they've rebounded, they've intermarried with other peoples, Mandan, you know, not just 
just other Mandans, but also Hadazas, Arikaras, Lakotas, whites, blacks, you know, e everybody. So uh, there's no specific uh, number I can, I can cite to you about the Mandans in particular because they're so intermarried with other peoples. And they, they had to intermarry to survive. Uh, what I, I don't it, what it's for oil what, right. it not for gas yeah. what, what sort of things are you seeing oh what sort of in the communities well okay so what what's what's happened and I you know I'm not an expert in what's going on today but in the allotment period individual families were given individual land plots uh, many families sold their allotments and with them they sold their mineral rights uh, and so what this means is that a handful of families who did not sell their allotments have retained mineral rights and they're now prospering um, because they're able to sell mineral rights, they're able to retire, to, you know, their, their kids don't have to work and all. Meanwhile, uh, neighboring families no longer have mineral rights and are suffering, I can show you some slides of, of what you know the kind of damage that's being done in the communities um, but so they're seeing just just their entire landscape is being transformed thanks to this this process this is a native a, a native cemetery at a congregational church you can see it's cheek by jowl right next to a staging area I mean this is sacred turf you know there's latrines there now um, the traffic the truck traffic on the reservation, uh, you know, we see a lot of it ourselves, is unbelievable. I mean, there are now traffic jams in Newtown, North Dakota. Uh, and I can say that just, gosh, eight years ago, I was riding my bike on these roads. Uh, you know, and, and it would be a long, solitary bike ride. I wouldn't dream of getting out there on a bike today. Uh, but what's ha the, the long and short of it is that we're, we're, we're having uh, there are haves and have nots now on the reservation in ways that there weren't even 10 years ago. And it's been extremely disruptive. Did I put this other slide in here? Uh, there's been illegal dumping. It's a huge illegal dump uh, that one man in the community you know, the, the three tribes like to point fingers at each other. They say there was an Arikara man who did it, and then actually it was Arikara women who demonstrated and closed down this dump. But Arikara man gave, gave them permission. He said, yeah, you can dump that stuff on this land over here. And it's, it's, it's immense. It, it's, it's immense. Um, and, you know, so there, the disruptions are manifold. Uh, there, there's, there have been accusations that one of the people helping to people negotiate uh, to sell their mineral rights, that he was skimming off the top um, or underselling and then getting bribes. And, uh, it, it's, it remains to be seen how it's going to unfold. The elders now tend to compare the events today to the flooding in the wake of the completion of the Garrison Dam in 1953. Um, they're saying this is this is our generation, you know, the, this generation's garrison dam. What, uh, were they allotments on the reservation, or were they? Okay. They were on the reservation, yeah. I have a friend who, I think he, he said he was Hadatsa, but he showed me photographs of his grandfather farming in the early winter first half of the 20th century, I assume, then it didn't look any different than other agriculture at that time to me. Absolutely. They had tractors and yeah, absolutely. fuels. And In the first half of the 20th century, the Mandans, Hadazas, and Arikaras were, uh, they had these prosperous middle-class towns down in the river bottoms. Um, flourishing farms fer fertilized by the you know annual floods of the Missouri River and then the Garrison Dam backed up the water flooded the Indians out of their towns 
forced them to occupy the mesa tops, basically, where there is no water, where the, the, the grass is incredibly hard to plow, um, and, and it, the disruption persists to the present day. Yes, Preston. The Lakota people, yeah, Lakota. yeah. And how huge and common was that? Also, did they have U.S. cavalry ever to deal with? And lastly, could you touch on the, I don't know how familiar you are with the whole Lord Churchill brouhaha about some of his... Okay, you're going to have to remind me of these okay. three points. <laughs> um, Lakota people and Mandan people had a love-hate relationship. Um, there was a persistent state of warfare, but then when they needed to, they set aside their animosities and then they trade. Uh, and for somebody who doesn't, of a different mindset, it can be absolutely maddening to read through the documents because literally one day they're killing each other. And the next day, they're coming in to trade with each other. I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. You know, how do you do that? Um, but it, it was a love-hate relationship. There's intermarriage, uh, and then the next, you know, then then there would be a war, and captives would be taken, and they'd live as say Lakota Sioux for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, little children would be, or or women would be, taken, and and they'd intermarry and become essentially Lakota. Um, so it's a complicated relationship. Now, you ask about the U.S. Cavalry. One of the things that I think is so fascinating about the Mandans is that they're, they suffered such devastating consequences from what I'll call colonization, and there was never a single warfare, a single outburst of violence between Mandans and French Anglo or U.S. newcomers. Not a single outburst of violence. Now, I mentioned Henry Atkinson's forces visiting the village. That was uh, to basically to negotiate a treaty, not a treaty that was resolving a conflict, but just a, a treaty of friendship and, and commerce. Uh, and as for, for Ward Churchill, I've never met Ward Churchill. Um, I do know a lot about germ warfare because of my, my earlier work on smallpox, uh, and, I, and I actually did an essay on, on uh, the history of, of smallpox being used against Native peoples. Uh, and there is no evidence that it was done deliberately on the Upper Missouri Village, uh, on the Upper Missouri River. Now, was it an act of profound Irresponsibility, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, to, to have this St. Peter's, the, the, the steamboat going up and down the river with smallpox aboard, with people getting off and interacting with native peoples, and this disease that people understood. People understood how it was transmitted. They understood that, that clothing or blankets or, you know, uh, could transmit the virus. Um, you know, we, this was this was a commonplace. Um, it was a profoundly irresponsible act. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. In whatever he may have got wrong for Churchill, there's a lot to his work that I would appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I also want to say there were acts of deliberate germ warfare against Native Americans. The most famous one took place in 1763 uh, during Pontiac's Rebellion at a place called Fort Pitt, which is Pittsburgh today. Uh, where Lord Jeffrey Amherst uh, engaged in correspondence uh, with his subordinates at the pit, and they gave the Indians two blankets and a handkerchief, deliberately taken from the smallpox hospital. And a, a fur trader named William Trent actually wrote in, wrote in his journal at the time, after they had given the Indians these items, he wrote, we hope it will have the desired effect. That you know, speaks for itself. Um, other questions? Yes. Have you written? Uh, I'll get you in a second. Go ahead. Have you written a separate essay about visiting that site, the first part you read? Because it sounded like something I've already read. 
Oh, really? <laughs> and I don't know whether it was another person visiting a place like that or not. No, this is, no, I haven't, Bible. yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I have not written a separate essay about it. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes, you had a question. So you used one image uh, of Edward uh, Curtis? Yeah, back in the very beginning. Are you familiar with more of his work? Uh, well, he, he, yeah, he's a famous photographer. He did a lot of staging, and, and, but, he, but, he's, but he's, a one, he's a wonderful documentarian, too. You know, wonderful, problematic, just like these painters were. Yeah, I, they're all wonderful, problematic, just just like I am, right? <laughs> you know, wonderful and problematic, you know, because we all have our flaws, so and we. It shows, uh, it shows a, 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 a timely image of the of the things that were happening. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm in, I'm immensely grateful for all that work. I really am. Yeah. Other questions, comments, observations. Well, thank you for, for coming out, everyone. <laughs>